Think about the last time your life went off the rails. Life, some, something went wrong, something happened. How long was it until you got the first phone call? Right? How long was it until someone wanted to check in on you? Or Facebook, or email, or something, check in. I mean, that's what communities do, right? They check in on each other when, when uh, something goes wrong. On occasion, even a letter will show up. Those old-fashioned things with, like you write on paper. Uh, I was, uh, received a few of those this week uh, out of concern for me and my family after uh, a rather miserable last weekend. Thank you. Um, all right, so we, we, we check in on each other when, when things go wrong. That's what we are reading today. We are reading uh, at the beginning of Revelation, we have this, this letter. The book of Revelation as a whole is this letter, and it begins with a set of seven letters. The beginning of the bigger letter is the set of seven letters written to the seven churches in one area of the Roman Empire. Churches that would all have known John. They would have all known that they were having a hard time the persecution under the Emperor Domitian had begun. And uh, this is a letter they receive, uh, this greater letter, a letter of hope written to persecuted churches. And uh, this is what John sends. John is using the fastest technology available in the day. He, he has this, uh, this cutting edge technology, the, the circular letter. He will send it to one church and then they'll pass it around to the next. He is not going to write seven copies of, of the same letter. He's, uh, he's kind of holed up on an island He's lucky to have pen and paper, much less be able to make seven copies. So he writes one letter, and it is passed around to the seven churches of what's known as Asia Minor. Now, why seven? Which churches? Which seven churches? You may remember that the numbers in uh, Revelation are symbolic. They, they usually have a, a meaning to them. Uh, They're written to the seven churches, and the seven is, is number of, of the wholeness. And so you can read this as a letter that's written to the wholeness of the church. You can also observe that there are, well, seven churches in Asia Minor, so he writes to all the major churches of Asia Minor. There happens to be seven of them. And, and people have taken these churches and, and sort of tried to extrapolate seven ages, seven periods in history, and try to make a big deal of the order that they're in. Um, the order that they're in is the order that they're, in, that, that they're on the highway. Like the order from here to, to Kirksville, Macon, what's the next town? Green City, then Green Castle, blah, blah, blah. Nah, that, that's the order that the letters are written in. If you look on the front of your bulletin, there is a, a picture of the seven churches on a map. And if you follow the, the numbering of the churches, that's the number in, in, in which they are addressed. That, that, that's the path of the Roman roads that, that would have been used to transfer, to, to carry the, the order. So there is no hidden meaning behind the order of the churches. That's just the order they were on the highway. But uh, So he writes to these, these seven churches. And we begin this, this letter today. We, we go back to the beginning of Revelation and we begin looking at the, these letters. Now, when you open a letter for, from someone you care for deeply, there is a sense of expectation. You're cracking it open, you're taking a look at what you're getting, and you're excited to see what is happening. Especially with a letter like this. John is writing to persecuted churches. They need some good news. And he is writing, and he begins by describing how he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and how he is uh, having this, this vision, this message given to him by the Son of Man, who is holding a lampstand with seven... Uh, seven candles, and each of the candles is one of the churches, and then these are the letters addressed to each of the seven churches. And so this is wonderful news. This is great news. The churches that are being persecuted are getting individual messages from Jesus. This is wonderful, right? This is something to be excited about. And so they start reading these letters, and we read the first one of them just a minute ago, and they all follow about the same pattern. They all begin with... I. Praise. I know that you have endured. I know that you have kept the faith. I know that you have kept my word. There's some word of praise that Jesus has for the churches. I, I'm so proud of you, you, for you have endured. You have rejected what the Nicolaitans, this heretical group, have taught. You have held on to the faith. 
And then the next part of the letter is always, then I have this against you. I have this against you, that you have abandoned your first love. You have fallen asleep. You tolerate Jezebel. You have become lukewarm. Neither hot nor cold, you have become lukewarm. And then it ends with a promise. If you address this problem, if you handle this problem, here is the promise. You will eat of the tree of life. You will wear the white robes of salvation. You will share with me a place on my throne. These are the, the form of the letters. Praise, but I have this against you, and here's a promise to hold on to as you address the, the problem I've just pointed out. That would be a slightly awkward letter to get, wouldn't it? Right? If you're going through and you're, you get to the section where it's addressing your church, and here you go, it's written to us, here we go, we can't wait to hear what, what Jesus has to say to us. Can you imagine being gathered together as a church and someone tells you, you're doing a good job at this, but I have this against you. But it's going to be fine, hold on to the promise. I, I can see people saying, you know, John, we are getting persecuted for faith in Jesus already, and you want to pile on? You're giving us flack. We're already catching enough flack from everyone else, and you're wanting to tell us what we're messing up. I, I feel that this is probably especially the case for uh, two churches, Sardis, which is called Asleep and Dead, and Laodicea, which gets no praise at all. The, the, the letter to the church at Laodicea starts out with, I have this against you. There's no praise. It goes straight to, you're lukewarm. Ugh. So, how, you know, there's this question, how, do you do de how does John dare criticize and critique the very churches that are having a rough time because of their, their faith, right? And it seems even more out of place to have these kind of practical letters here because we all know what's about to happen, right? In the next page is Revelation, we're going to have trumpets blowing, plagues, the four horsemen. The, this, I mean, we have all this fantastic, the beast, the woman, the harlot, Jezebel. We have all this fantastic imagery that's about to happen and we're starting out out with like a dressing down? What? Well, this is kind of weird. Now, in the context of persecution, a church, these churches are catching flack for following Jesus. And, and so, in the context of pers persecution, if you look at it with the rest of the letter, it does begin to make sense what is happening here, right? It, it, they're, all these symbols are about to be used to describe the persecution they're going through, but at the beginning, uh, the churches have to decide how are they going to respond to persecution? Well, what is their response to having a rough go? And Jesus is telling them to shape up, I have this against you, shape up, and now double down on your faith if you want to receive the, this, this promise. To do, Jesus is challenging the churches to respond to persecution in the way that he did. Not to lash out, to hurt others, not to blame others, but to continue to do as Christ did, to continue to love and to serve and forgive. Right? You know, it's not a given that the churches would do this either. There are other options these churches could have been considering. If you think about... What's it, what's it like to get persecuted for what you believe? You could either lash out and say, well, neener, 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 back at you. Or you could, and you say it in Greek, because neener, neener, neener doesn't translate well. But uh, you could lash out at others, or you can blame others for, for you, don't just un, you don't understand us. Or the, the sort of the temptation that must have been there is, you know, if I'm catching a hard time for following Jesus, well, maybe... Maybe I just stop following Jesus. My life would be a lot easier right now, right? And so there's this question, what will they do? How will the churches respond to persecution? This is the second time they've been persecuted as well. The first time had been persecution under Emperor Nero, and Nero was a wingnut. Nero was crazy. When he was told that he could not knock down the center of... Like, imagine Rahm Emanuel wanting to knock down uh, the, the central downtown, like, like Michigan Street, the Empire Street, all that stuff in downtown, uh, just to build himself a fancy house. What would he be told? No. That's what Nero did. He wanted to knock down the center of Rome, the biggest city in the world, to build himself a fancy new palace with a gold statue about four times his life size. Dude was wingnut. And, uh, and he got told no. And so this, the theory is, is that he burned the city himself. And, and the, myth, the myth is that he, he played a fiddle while Rome burned. Now whether he played the fiddle or not while Rome burned, it may not be factually true, or fa it might be not, might be like historically accurate, but it, it, there's a there's some truth there. The dude was crazy. He could have played a fiddle while Rome burned, and so then he blames the Christians, and so the Christians are persecuted for the first time. 
And, and maybe they had a, a sense of what they were going to do under persecution, but uh, to quote that very wise man, uh, Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. Right? You have a plan, and then what happens? You get punched for the first time, and then you just kind of react. You just kind of survive. So the Christian, the churches have gone through a persecution for the first time, and they've gotten through it. Now it's happening again. And the second time it happens, there's no surprise here, right? There's no surprise. They know something's going to happen. They're starting to get this understanding that uh, to follow Jesus might mean they're going to be persecuted. And so they have to figure out, okay, what are we really going to do about this? When we get persecuted, we have to figure out how to turn the other cheek when we just got punched. It's a lot easier to talk about it when your cheek doesn't hurt, right? So now they're facing a persecution again. And this decision they're about to make, how to respond to persecution, is so important that Jesus himself sends these letters to the seven churches to make sure they choose wisely to double down on their faith, to recommit to following Jesus. Right? That is uh, the, what Jesus is asking them to do. And the fact that this decision has to be made is a spiritual decision is shown shows up in the actual letters. If you look, notice how the letters are addressed. Are the letters addressed to the church? They're addressed to the angels of the church. Ooh, there are all of the churches, all, all the letters to them. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, the letters to the church are all addressed saying, to the angel of the church. It's not written to the church, it's written to the angel of the church. What are you talking about when you're talking about the church? Are you talking about the building? Nah. You're, are you talking about the administrative board? Nah. You're talking about the gathered people. You're talking about right here. What are we doing right now? This is the spiritual center of the church. How we relate to each other, how we draw close to each other, how we desire to follow Jesus together. That is the angel of this church. It is a spiritual decision that needs to be made here. And so it's a spiritual approach that is being taken. Th these letters are addressed to the angel of the church. And at the end of the seven letters, Jesus writes to the, the churches, he says, Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. This is the famous image, right, of Jesus knocking on the door. It's not Jesus knocking on the door of an individual person's house. It's Jesus knocking on the door of the church who has gathered to worship. And he is saying, I will come in and eat with you if you hear me knocking on the door. And so we have this question. What will stop them from hearing Jesus knocking? Well, all these things that he has laid out, but I have this against you, right? If you don't do this, if you don't address these things that I have against you, you will not hear me knocking. You will make a bad decision. You will not survive the persecution. You will be scattered. And so, if we look at what does Jesus lay out as what does Jesus have against the churches, uh, here is the chart of all the seven churches. It lays out uh, the praise. I know your works. I know your poverty. I know that you have held fast. I know you have not... A few have not soiled their clothes. I know you have little power, but keep my word and not deny my name. But here is the, the column, that's the center column that's important. And I'll give you copies of this if you'd like the copy of this chart. Here is the blame. I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Think about the, the drive, the passion that comes when people first start following Jesus. People who have lost that first drive, that first love. That, that will stop you from hearing Jesus knocking at the door. The, down to Pergamum. I, I have this against you. You hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. You hold to people who teach what is false. I, I don't see a lot of people, uh, Nicolaitans, running around teaching today, but I do see people preaching things like, well, the prosperity gospel, that if you just pray to Jesus, Jesus is this cosmic sugar daddy, he's just going to give you exactly what you want, just pray, think happy thoughts, life will get better, right? Eh, that's not really the case, and, and that I have this against you at Pergamum, that they are giving in to these tempting other versions of, of the gospel. That you tolerate Jezebel. Jezebel uh, is a stand and a symbol for harlotry and, and, and uh, sexual immorality in the New Testament is often correlated with uh, going other, after other false gods. So tolerating Jezebel would probably have something to do with uh, 
playing fast and loose with you can follow Jesus and you can do whatever else you want and, and Jesus' problem is no, I'm, I'm either your Jesus, you follow me or not, you can't mix and match this is not a buffet uh, going down to Laodicea Sardis, dead works and asleep, that's pretty straightforward, not doing anything. A church that isn't doing anything is not going to hear Jesus knocking. And then at the bottom in the center, Laodicea is lukewarm. I have this against you, you are lukewarm. Laodicea, if, if you look at uh, the front of the bulletin, it's number seven, Laodicea is landlocked. And so it receives its drinking water from hot springs, and that water is piped in. And it was piped in, it had just long enough to cool down to become lukewarm. And so the entire city drank lukewarm water. And is there anything more disgusting than lukewarm water on a hot day? You're sweating, you want something nice and cool to suck on, and just, mm, I'm looking forward to lukewarm. Yeah. Right? I spit you out. You are lukewarm. And so these are the things that, that Jesus names to the seven churches. If you don't address these problems, you will not hear me knocking. You need to double down on your faith. Not commit to following me. Address these problems that you have corporately as a church, and that is how you will be able to respond to this persecution, be able to follow me, be able to maintain the faith and receive the promise, the promise of the crown of life, the white stone with a new name, power over the nations, white robes, a name that will not be blotted out, a pillar in the temple of God. Come and eat, and you will receive a place on my throne. That's the promise that is being given by Jesus to these seven churches. Now, the promise of these letters is not that the persecution will end if they just do the right things, right? Domitian, the emperor of the Roman Empire, he will fall, but he's not going to fall because the Christians take him out, right? This is not a promise that somehow they're going to change the persecution. If you read uh, the entirety of the book of Revelation, it is never what the church does to end persecution, it's what God does. There's never any great battle in uh, Revelation, even Armageddon, right? Armageddon, the great final battle, everyone gets geared up for it, and it never happens because God stops it. God is the one who stops persecution and stops war from happening. It's the promise to the church that if you, are, if you double down on your faith, you address the problems that you have, you follow me, you will get through this. You will, it's not that if you believe hard enough, everything will turn into sunshine and roses this afternoon. It's that you will be able to survive and, and thrive and be able to follow me through whatever it is that you face. There's a lady named Brene Brown who captures this sense of what Jesus is asking. When Brene Brown is a, she's an academic who uh, researches grief, and she has a great TED talk on this, actually, if you, you watch those. But um, she researches grief, and at one point in her life, she was in some pain and some suffering, and she went to the church, and as she puts it, she went to the church because she wanted the church to be an epidural to make all the pain go away, and that's not what she found. She went to the church, and the church was not an epidural that made the pain go away. The church was a midwife that says, here's how you get through the pain. I'll walk with you through it, and it's worth it. To, to get through the other side. Church is not an epidural, it is a midwife. It tells you that the pain will pass, the persecution will end, and it will be worth it, for we will be together on the other side of this. So that's what these letters tell the churches. Collectively, they're telling the churches, double down on your faith, the persecution will pass, it will be worth it, Domitian, the emperor of the Roman Empire, will fall, and a new day will dawn. If you can hold on through this time, you will be able to survive and thrive. You double down on your faith, address the challenges in your churches, and when I knock, I will be there to eat with you. Do not lash out, do not blame others, just keep on following Jesus. Jesus sends these letters to the churches in the year 94, 95 AD. And it was true for them then, and it is true for us today. Jesus is knocking, and if we are listening, he desires to come and eat with us. And so we are also to double down on our faith, even when it is hard, even when we have to address those things, but I have this against you, the type of things that Jesus says. We do these things, for the promise of Jesus will be fulfilled, and a new day will dawn. And we will go into that day together in the name of Christ. Amen.